Actions considered, for example, corrupt in highly developed countries and democracies might be seen as normal and even necessary in other societies, for example, in the Western Balkans. Paying a 10% on public procurement contracts is an unwritten standard and quite prevalent in all Western Balkan countries. And there are those that argue that it is better to have investments and have this 10% corruption fee rather than having less investments and no corruption. Afterwards, it was discovered that this was an organized scheme of embezzlement and missing voicing and corruption. Already we have one minister who has been sentenced 10 years in jail, one high-level director in the ministry also sentenced, also several second-level officials are in jail, the vice prime minister is under investigation and he is on the run and he is in search by the law authorities, also, the private investors are also hiding to avoid imprisonment, which has been sentenced. I think that in general, tax evasion in this region is seen something that if you can do it without any consequences, then you should do it. I think there is really wrong opinion about what and how tax evasion really damages the society. But if you are brave enough, some say if you're crazy enough, you will go and report it. But what happens then? In this episode, we're talking about money. Welcome to Deep Dive from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. And this is Illicit Financial Flows in the Western Balkans. If you can do it without consequences, then you should do it. So, illicit financial flows, or IFFs, what does it mean and why do they matter? Put it this way, any illicit market, drug trafficking, people smuggling, the illegal wildlife trade, arms trafficking and so on, all of these are connected to IFFs. IFFs is about money, or more precisely, the movement of money across borders that is illegal in some way. This could mean it came from a criminal act, like corruption or its money associated with the markets I mentioned before. Maybe it could be legitimately earned money that is transferred in a way that evades taxation, like being paid in cash and not declaring it, or money is funneled into complex corporate schemes and secrecy jurisdictions. Or perhaps its ultimate use is something like terrorist financing or funding organised criminal activity. So why do they matter? Well, former CIA intelligence officer and Treasury Special Agent John A. Kassara wrote that criminals and criminal organizations do not traffic in narcotics, people and weapons for the sake of the criminal act. They do not engage in scams and fraud to make innocents suffer. They engage in illegal behavior because of the money the criminal actions generate. Now, we can't cover every aspect of IFFs. It is a huge topic. Instead, we need to be selective. They were going to follow the money in the Western Balkans. Money laundering. Now, this is a term that I'm sure everyone has heard of, but it makes sense to quickly go over what it is. But first, and forgive my indulgence, I want to talk about the history of the term because I can't resist a good story. Legend has it that the term money laundering was coined during Prohibition in the United States, so the 1920s, early 1930s. Organised criminals became heavily involved in the smuggling of alcohol into the United States. And it was during this period that the so-called Five Families emerged as a powerful force in New York. But you also had the outfit in Chicago under Scarface himself, Al Capone. Anyway, Capone and the other Mafia groups were looking for ways to clean their dirty money. And so they purchased cash businesses and mixed their illicit funds with legitimate. And in this case, it was alleged that laundromats were chosen. Hence the term money laundering. The reality is certainly interesting in its own right, albeit less mythical. The first documented use of the term related to the Watergate scandal in the 1970s which, considering multiple books have been written about this specific subject, I won't go into here. 
So if we go back to the Western Balkans and specifically the small nation of Kosovo, there is a distinct problem when it comes to money laundering. Almost a lack of willingness to investigate. Investigators, prosecutors, but also judges seem to lack knowledge about the crime of money laundering. They have been more oriented in investigation of other crimes, for example, drug trafficking, organized crime, smuggling with migrants, etc. While money laundering somehow has not been a priority. And this is the case that we have seen in all Western Balkan countries. This is Dardan Kashorni, the field coordinator for Kosovo for the South Eastern Europe Observatory at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. This is because this field is more complex to be investigated. It is more difficult to generate results, especially in short term. It requires a strong interinstitutional cooperation expertise. There is a general lack of understanding, etc. So all of this has caused to have little allocation of resources to build capacities. I see willingness among law enforcement institutions in, in Kosovo, especially the FIU, to investigate uh, money laundering cases, but also in police and also to some new prosecutors that were recently appointed. And they have already shown some good results. However, I think that this field needs a stronger will by the government in order to prioritize this area, which means to allocate more budget, but also resources to strengthen capacities. So what exactly is money laundering and how does it work? Let's say an organized criminal is involved in a large shipment of cocaine. They've been paid millions of dollars. These are the proceeds of a crime and therefore dirty money. And so money laundering is the process of making that dirty money appear to be clean. And this can be achieved in three stages. Placement, layering, integration. So let's start at the beginning, placement. This is the moment when illicit money is placed into the financial system, but it's done in a way to disguise the true ownership and to not raise the suspicions of anti-money laundering systems. This is the moment law enforcement see criminals at their most vulnerable because it's hard to place a load of cash into a bank without being noticed. To achieve this, they might bulk smuggle cash across borders, which is an act of illegality in its own right. Usually around 10,000 either dollars, euros or pounds. In China, it's even less, uh, the equivalent of about $5,000. Often, organized criminals move the money into jurisdictions that have less stringent controls or perhaps corrupt banking officials placed within a financial institution that are willing to accept dirty money. A good example of this was a story I recently saw in the UK, where six cash smugglers were sentenced for their part in an international money laundering network. They carried out 83 separate trips from the UK to Dubai, smuggling over £100 million in just 12 months. Another option is the use of couriers, or a smurf. Now, this has nothing to do with those creepy little blue people who live in mushrooms. Where the term originated from is uncertain, but ACAMS reported that it originated with Colombian cartels using what they described as blue-haired old ladies to carry out money laundering transactions. So it's a term given to someone who is participating in smurfing, which is a form of structuring in the laundering process. This is where a large transaction is broken up into smaller ones and deposited by a number of smurfs into multiple bank accounts so that it doesn't trigger the need for a suspicious activity report, or SAR, and the further scrutiny that comes with it. Honestly, you'll never look at those little blue people the same again. The next phase is layering. Again, here it's about trying to disconnect the dirty money from the illegal activity that generated it. And the thing is, a money launderer can keep layering over and over again, the more times it's done, the harder it is to connect the money to that original illegal act. For those serious organized criminals or corrupt officials, the money likely passes through secrecy jurisdictions that have little to no financial regulations. They perhaps require a very small amount of tax on the money as it travels through, but all they have to provide in return is a lack of regulation. We saw just how prevalent this is with the various leaks over the years like the Panama Papers or the Paradise Papers or the FinCEN files. 
By moving money to another jurisdiction, the national investigating authorities have no legal jurisdiction once it's crossed that border. So funds could be transferred to offshore accounts through multiple shell companies, and then those funds could be used to buy and sell stocks and bonds, or maybe create fake invoices for non-existent businesses allowing you to move money in and out. Basically, you're trying to create a complex web of moral bankruptcy. And then finally, you have integration. And this is when the money is clean. Its illicit origin is largely hidden. The money can be reintroduced into legitimate society by buying luxury goods like cars or jewellery or artwork. Or better yet, you can use a shell company whose beneficial owner is of course hidden under layers of corporate secrecy to purchase real estate, a yacht, or maybe a private jet. Let's get back to Kosovo. As Daran said before, in Kosovo there is a general lack of understanding as well as a lack of resources, which makes investigating money laundering particularly difficult. But also, culturally, attitudes towards corruption differ. Actions considered, for example, corrupt in highly developed countries and democracies might be seen as normal and even necessary in other societies, for example, in the Western Balkans. Paying a 10% on public procurement contracts is an unwritten standard and quite prevalent in all Western Balkan countries. And there are those that argue that it is better to have investments and have this 10% corruption fee rather than having less investments and no corruption. So changing the culture of corruption is a long-term and very complex process, and it requires a multidimensional approach, starting from education, which is very important, to address both the root causes and the systems of corruption, while promoting a culture of transparency, accountability, and ethical behavior. That 10% extra that's paid to secure contracts essentially means corruption is baked into public procurement. And Kosovo is not alone in this. Corruption is a global issue. There are no countries untouched by it. According to Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index 2022, 155 countries have made no significant progress against corruption or have declined since 2012. The role of money laundering and illicit financial flows more broadly are not widely understood and studied across the Western Balkans region. And that's why recently the GI has focused a considerable amount of research into this area. A collaborative approach between civil society, journalists and academia can help close that information gap. Jointly, they can play a vital role in raising awareness, in uncovering IFFs cases or money laundering cases, to monitor implementation of key national policies and legislation, to advocate for government to strengthen measures, to strengthen public-private partnerships, but also involvement of civil society organizations in drafting process, in monitoring of implementation, in awareness campaigns, etc., and also to increase transparency and accountability of institutions. And despite everything, there has been some progress in investigating and prosecuting money laundering cases. In the last years, we have seen some legislative initiatives which include amending the law on prevention and combating of money laundering in Kosovo, but also drafting a new law on the register of beneficial ownership. Both laws are very important in this field, and I believe that once these laws are adopted, it will affect in a positive way the implementation of measures. One positive development is that we have new special prosecutors, both in age but also in position, who are increasingly more willingness to investigate money laundering cases, which is encouraging for better results in the future. I think that it is worth mentioning also a case initiated by Kosovo Financial Intelligence Unit called OneCoin, or Kuma, which involved a global multi-billion dollar cryptocurrency fraud, which marked the first successful standalone money laundering prosecution and conviction case in Kosovo, which led to a 1 million asset confiscated in Kosovo. Now this is a case and a story that has fascinated me. Who remembers a cryptocurrency called OneCoin, the Bitcoin killer as it was once dubbed? It was run by the now infamous fugitive Ruja Ignatova, 
In two years, nobody will speak about Bitcoin anymore. And I thank you very much for being here, sharing my vision and just making this happen. Thank you very much. Who's currently on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. As Darden said, millions of victims invested billions of dollars in the one coin fraud. There was an incredibly good podcast series and now book about this story from the BBC called The Missing Crypto Queen. Kosovo played a part in the unravelling of this fraudulent nonsense that was OneCoin. And it all started with a Kosovan bank submitting a suspicious transaction report, an STR, back in 2017. The Financial Intelligence Unit started investigating the STR and they happened across one local entity called Kuma and two international websites. Kuma had four shareholders, two Kosovans and two Danish citizens. The purpose of Kuma? They sold online tutorial packages for investing in OneCoin. Now I should say that OneCoin was created by a company called OneLife that also made its money by selling educational, and I use that term so loosely you wouldn't believe, educational packages on how to invest in OneCoin. The other thing to say is that just a few months before, Kosovo was admitted to the Egmont Group in 2017, which is a global organisation where 170 financial intelligence units from around the world share intelligence with one another to combat money laundering, terrorist financing and other crimes. And it was by working with other Egmont Group members that just two months after this, Kosovo was not only able to bring a successful money laundering indictment and prosecution against the four shareholders of Kuma, they proved that Kuma was a front company being used to funnel money via a jewellery shop in Denmark for the beneficial owner, One Life Network Limited, registered in Belize, which did not have a trading license and therefore it was an offence. This case in Kosovo was chosen by the Egmont Group as one of its best cases between 2014 and 2020. At the end of September this year, Albania's Special Court on Corruption and Organised Crime, or SPAC, handed down a guilty verdict on the former Environment Minister Lefta Koka. Alongside a dozen other officials and businessmen, Koka was sentenced to jail for his role in a scandal known as the Incinerator Case. He is appealing this decision. Now this case is a perfect example of how the private sector, state officials, public procurement and corruption can intermingle. This case revolves around three concession contracts awarded back in 2014, 2016 and 2017. Now a concession contract can be used for a bunch of different things. For example, let's say there's a private business within a national park. They are given a right by the national park to operate a cafe or a bike rental service. They're given the right to build some buildings they need to operate, like a visitor centre. But the private company has to maintain it and stick to the regulations in place. They're given a contract that lasts for a certain time period and are required to pay maybe an annual rate or a percentage of revenue. It's an example of that public-private partnership you often hear politicians talking about. So as I said, there were three of these contracts awarded for the construction to build three energy-to-waste incinerators in Albania. They would be located in Albasan, Fia and Tirana. And according to Transparency International, these three incinerators were valued at 178 million euros. The problem was that in all three of these cases, the companies awarded the contracts had no prior experience in this kind of venture. In fact, they were all created just a few months before and were the sole companies to bid. If that wasn't enough, an investigation by the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network showed that each of the successful companies were connected to one another through the same group of individuals. It was financed by public funds and also it included performance warranty, meaning that despite the fact that the incinerator was to be built by public funds, should the company result with lower profits than a certain threshold fixed in the contract, the missing profits still had to be covered by the public budget. This is Sokol Tosca, a legal auditor in Albania who worked closely with the Global Initiative on our illicit financial flows work in the region. Afterwards, it was discovered that this was an organized scheme of embezzlement and missing voicing and corruption. Already we have one minister who has been sentenced 10 years in jail, one high-level director in the ministry also sentenced, 
Also, several second-level officials are in jail. The vice prime minister is under investigation and he is on the run and he is in search by the law authorities. Also, the private investors are also hiding to avoid imprisonment, which has been sentenced. So this was a case which has been discovered in the media and also the organizers have been sentenced already. I think this is the most representative form of financial crimes existing in Albania. I mean, a close connection between organized crime with corrupted officials and also working on financial channels and trying to include the illicit flows or profits in the formal market. Sokol's right. A number of high-profile people implicated in this case have fled to various places, including the former Deputy Prime Minister, Arben Armitaj, who is accused by SPAC of money laundering, corruption and falsifying personal wealth statements, which politicians are required to submit annually in Albania. This case is very much ongoing. Just a few weeks ago, Armitage, who denies the allegations against him, took to Facebook to again deny these allegations and others relating to a bread factory. As a result, SPAC sent a letter to Facebook's parent company, Meta, asking them to find out the location of the former deputy prime minister. His whereabouts are currently unknown. If we go back to the now jailed former environment minister, Lefta Koka, according to SPAC, one of the companies, Energy BV SPV, which won the contract for the Tirana incinerator, was on paper controlled by two foreign nationals, but they were acting as fronts. It was actually controlled by two Albanian citizens called Clodian Zotto and Morel Matiri, who allegedly bribed Koka funneling 5.1 million euros through a series of companies. The public procurement contracts are a prime source of corruption earnings. According to several sources in Albania and also consistent with the OECD estimate, up to 30% of the bid value of procurement contracts is paid in bribes in Albania. Although corruption is a worldwide problem, it is particularly damaging in developing countries or countries in transition. The corruption undermines the legitimacy and effectiveness of state institutions, of course, and deters productive investments and also the competitive markets. However, the bribery on the public procurement contracts is widely accepted and expected by the private sector. So they are aware of it and they have begun to see it as a business cost. Otherwise, securing the public contract might be impossible. Prosecutors also investigated the Elbasan plant and discovered that seven companies were used to transfer bribes. Invoices from three of those companies were analysed by SPAC, and it was concluded that the signatures were the work of the same person, Stella Gugalia. But each time it's alleged she used different names, appearing to sign for both the buyer and the seller. Zotto and Mertiri are also accused of funneling 491 million euros to the former Deputy Prime Minister, Armitage, only Koka is serving time. Zotto, Matiri, Gugalia have all been convicted in absentia, but like Amitage, are currently fugitives. Two of the companies, Albtech Energy and Integrated Technology Services, have both been confiscated by the state. There is so much more to this story, and journalists like those at the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network have put in the legwork. So I'll put a link to a few of their stories in the podcast notes. The incinerator case was an example of how the financial system can be manipulated and exploited by unscrupulous business owners and politicians. But as we know, Albania also has a prolific reputation for organised crime. According to the Global Organised Crime Index, Albanian organised crime is involved in a number of illicit markets, from human trafficking to counterfeit goods illicit tobacco to illegal logging, and drug trafficking to financial crimes. The groups that originate from here have become major players in the illicit drug markets of Western Europe and have close ties to Ndrangheta clans and cartels in South America. But back at home, in Albania, organised crime is increasingly linked with real estate, construction and the tourism industries. The construction sector in Albania is particularly susceptible to money laundering. 
because of the way it is structured. Firstly, new constructions almost universally require clients to prepay for the floor plan. I mean, at the moment that they receive the permit, without even beginning the works, they begin to sell and sign contracts and receive prepayments. Also, this industry is largely cash-based, according to real estate agents. Sales in cash are not uncommon. Generally, if we refer to information from the central bank, in 2019, it was generated 200 million euro of new mortgages in Albania. And generally, banks finance 50 to 70% of the apartment value. So this implies that apartments of worth 300 to 400 million were financed by mortgage loans. And yet, statistics show that real estate sales totaled roughly 1 billion euro in that period. So the difference, 500 million or more, is from unknown uh, origin. That is a lot of money unaccounted for. And it's not only the paying for real estate with cash. Organised crime is predatory. Remember that scene in the movie Goodfellas where Sonny Bunce, the owner of the Bamboo Lounge, asks the boss Paulie to come into business with him. He was asking for protection from Tommy, the character played by Joe Pesci. I just, uh, I need help. All right? Help me, please. You know. You know anything about this f***ing restaurant business? He knows everything about it. I mean, he's in a joint 24 hours a day. I mean, another another f***ing few, few minutes, it could be a stool. That's how often he's in there. You understand? You want me to be your partner? Yeah. That's what you're trying to tell me. You want me to be your partner? Yeah, what the f*** you think I'm talking about, Paulie? Please, come on. It's at this point that the Mafia members start using the business for their own criminal ends until eventually the business runs out of money and they move on. They're like leeches, sucking the life from whatever they've grabbed hold of. Criminal groups target construction companies and business people in this industry, which might have accumulated debt or loans to repay, finance them with cash, illicit money, try to get involved in the construction company, sometimes even by threat and violence. So the construction and the way the sector is organized and the legal framework and the regulations create the environment that this industry allow illicit flows and funds generated by the crime to get included in the formal channels. The other channel that is vulnerable to IFFs is the informal economy. So here we're talking about cash. The informal economy is just over 30% in Albania. And for the private sector, when all your competitors are operating in such a way, you're also liable to do so. Otherwise, you might be at a competitive disadvantage. Under declaring the number of workers on the payrolls or uh, paying wages in cash or uh, declaring lower wages is a widespread practice. There are several schemes in play to evade taxes involving cash transactions and also utilizing and exploiting other features of the informal economy. This is supported by the approach of the tax authorities and custom authorities if we refer to the numbers, the tax revenues in Albania collected by the Albanian authorities, they represent 19% of the GDP. And we, if we make a comparison to other countries, EU members, for example, they collect approximately, in average, 40% of the GDP. Even in the region, we have higher numbers. So, yes, the numbers and the perception and also the discussion in the media show that, yes, the tax evasion is phenomenal, widespread and with a deep impact in the economy. Now, let me just quickly go back to the incinerator case. Do you remember the person accused of signing invoices as both the buyer and the seller? SPAC alleged that to be a woman called Stella Gugalia. She was the administrator of Albtec Energy who won the contract for the incinerator at Elbasan. Like the others, she disappeared when the allegations appeared and was eventually tracked down to Vienna, where she has been arrested. And Albania are looking to extradite her. Anyway, according to SPAC, Gugalia created fake invoices for work that hadn't been carried out. Remember that these projects were funded by the Albanian state, so these fake invoices were paid for by the Albanian state. And when we talk about illicit financial flows, the manipulation of invoices, whether through fake invoicing like Albtech Energy did or misinvoicing, so the under or overvaluing of goods, 
These are effective ways to move illicit money. Generally, 900 million US dollars per year was the missing voicing gap. This makes about 6% of the GDP, which is quite a deal in real terms. So trade misinvoicing in regard with global trade exists, mainly in under-invoicing for imports to reduce tax payments in the customs, but also even for export they are under-invoicing. But misinvoicing and operating with manipulated invoices exists even in the internal market. This is a phenomenon which impacts tax payments and evasion, impacting VAT, impacting the tax on profits. And since the tax evasion is a present phenomenon in Albania and has a huge impact, yes, the trade misinvoicing is one of the forms manifested for the tax evasion. And that brings us nicely onto our final topic, tax evasion. And for this, we're heading northwest to Bosnia and Herzegovina. So what is tax evasion? Well, it's the intentional non-payment or underpayment of taxes. And it's very much illegal. As usual, I should add that tax avoidance, which is when a person or entity seeks to minimise its tax bill by exploiting a loophole or advantage, it's more like bending the rules in a way that was unintended but is not illegal. I think that in general, tax evasion in this region is seen something that if you can do it without any consequences, then you should do it. This is Anessa Agovic, the field coordinator for Bosnia and Herzegovina at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I think there is really wrong opinion about what and how tax evasion really damages the society. People are ignoring it. General opinion of the public is that certain people who are close to politics can get away with it. But if you are brave enough, some say if you're crazy enough, you will go and report it. But what happens then? Nothing happens usually. There is so much corruption in sense of like, if you have any link to a certain politician in power, you can, in some way, get away with it. According to the GI's report, illicit financial flows, key drivers and current trends in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro and Serbia, there is a prevailing attitude of tax non-compliance. People often see tax as the state stealing from individuals. In Bosnia and Herzegovina and Western Balkan region, these IFF components usually draw upon very widespread corruption, which is actually within the region like an endemic culture of the country. And tax evasion, we have seen that millions are lost annually. It is important to say that Bosnia and Herzegovina is very attractive for criminals and not only for its great strategic geographic position, but also for big potential of moving and hiding the means of unauthorized origin. When we say on how big is this tax evasion as an issue, according to international threat assessments, we have seen that when taken into context of the predicate criminal offenses to money laundering, usually criminals are involved also in corruption, drug trafficking, smuggling and trafficking of human beings, weapon smuggling, fraud, property crime and tax evasion where we can see that tax evasion is very closely related to corruption. And in that sense, those are the components of illicit financial flows that have been seen in a majority of cases, not only in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also within the region. One accountant that spoke with us estimated that up to 50% of income tax is evaded. It was revealed that employment tax evasion was widespread. With employees officially paid the minimum wage, but then supplemented with cash payments. And this is a trend across industries like agriculture, construction or tourism. And in some of these industries, employees often receive half their wages in cash. Now, this doesn't necessarily indicate illicit financial flows, but it certainly makes that a more likely possibility. One Bosnian financial crime officer said that evasion was down to a number of reasons, and perhaps it's worth me listing these. There is a dependence on cash, avoidance of customs control, high rates of tax and contributions on paid salaries. It's the opposite for employment contracts. The state's tolerance of the grey economy, 
inadequate capacity work of inspections, customs authorities, courts, prosecutors' offices and police, a complicated and inadequate tax system with regulations that change too frequently and incorrect determination of the value of imported goods. As you can see, there's a lot to work on. So who is enabling tax evasion? I bet you can guess. We can say relevant actors who should report on suspicious transactions or even on the belief that there is certain money laundering technique developed, for example, on the accountants or audits, they are the ones who should also support the system in the fight of this tax evasion. But in many cases, actually, this group of audits, accountants, but also notaries are playing important role in supporting this tax evasion. How? They're actually giving advices on how to avoid tax or providing methods. So in latest reports on money laundering and organized crime assessment, there are noted that, for example, consulting companies are one of the, we can say, tools that are being used for tax evasion, where there are like payment of fictitious consulting services through under, but mostly, over-invoicing. So as always, the question is why? Why isn't something being done to stop this? Once I talked with a senior official working on organized crime, and he literally said, how can you expect that we fight money laundering in general, specifically tax evasion, if there are politicians who should be pursued for it? So if there is no political willingness to really fight this issue, we have a longer way to go. Secondly, we need a much more efficient answer to a corruption. Corruption and tax evasion go together. Usually they are very linked and they facilitate each other. We need a stronger response to fight corruption and organized crime in order to improve the situation, not only in my country, but also in the Western Balkans. But besides the system start working efficiently against these issues, we need raising awareness campaigns or informative sessions with a name to provide the public to understand why illicit financial flows in the end damage themselves. Because the public is not understanding that that tax, which was avoided to be paid by a certain investor, a criminal, a politician, is damaging the well-being that could have been invested to the society. Illicit financial flows are complex. They cover a range of different things. We've only touched the surface of this issue. You could do an entire episode on trade-based money laundering, bulk cash smuggling or tax evasion. I mean, when you speak about dirty money sloshing around the global economy, people often cite the 1998 IMF consensus rate of 2 to 5%. So if you put that into context, according to the IMF, global GDP in 2023 was set to reach $105 trillion. So if between 2 to 5% is dirty money, that's between 2.1 and 5.25 trillion dollars. And if we look at the upper number, which is astronomical, 5.25 trillion, only the GDP of the United States and China is higher. Every other country is lower. And to be fair to the Western Balkans region, it's not an easy issue to solve. In the EU, according to a 2016 report from Europol, criminal proceeds in the EU are in excess of 110 billion euros. Annually, only 2.2% of that is seized, 1.1% of which is confiscated. And despite the serious IFF problems in the Western Balkans countries, societies across the world struggle to tackle this issue. At every turn, there are those with vested interests, be they organized criminals, corrupt politicians, or dishonest business owners willing to go to extremes to protect their wealth at the expense of all those around them. And there's an all too willing band of enablers aiding them to maintain the status quo. This isn't a Western Balkans problem. 
is a global one. That's it for this episode of Deep Dive. I'd like to thank Anessa, Sokol and Dardan for speaking to us. Remember that you can find any related reports from the Global Initiative's Southeastern Europe Observatory in the podcast notes, as well as a link to the Global Organised Crime Index, and of course, an extensive reading list relating to this topic. And if you'd like to check out more organised crime research from across the world, head over to our website, globalinitiative.org. This has been Deep Dive from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. Thanks for listening.